meaning when we uh, resume debate. Statements by members. Uh, Déclaration de député, the Honourable Member for Toronto Danforth. Mr. Speaker, today I am speaking in memory of Erna Paris. I didn't know her, but I can continue to learn from her even after she has passed away from her writing and her inspiration. So today we celebrate her life. She was a mother and she was dearly loved. She was a writer and a thinker, and she didn't just educate people, she also inspired. In fact, one of her proudest moments was that her book, Long Shadows, Truth, Lies, and History, was cited as the inspiration for a motion brought in this place to have a, an apology to First Nations people, Indigenous peoples, for the residential school's history. She was a member of the Order of Canada, she passed away recently, but Mr. Speaker, we can all continue to learn and be inspired by her voice. Rest in peace, Erna Paris. Oh. The Honourable Member for West Nova. Mr. Speaker, uh, last Wednesday, the community of Yarmouth in the riding of West Nova lost a beloved citizen, our friend Terry Muse, at the young age of 62. On the day of his passing, AHS paramedics, Yarmouth Regional Hospital ER, hospital staff, police officers, firefighters, friends, and family gathered outside his home to tri pay tribute and honour his memory. Terry was a father, a husband, a brother, a friend, a colleague, and a well-respected paramedic who went above and beyond his passion to serve his community for well over 44 years. For those who had the opportunity to meet Terry would agree with me that he was such a kind-hearted soul that he had a heart at least 10 times larger the Nova Scotia itself. <laughs> Whether he was talking about his visits to Graceland as Elvis Presley's biggest fan or about a Red Sox game, he was truly a generous and enjoyable person that you would want to be around. Mr. Speaker, one minute is way too short to honour Terry's memory, but I still wanted to honour him in one last time. To his friend uh, and his wife, Sandra, his two sons, Luke and Matt, I would like to once again offer my deepest sympathy and condolences. Terry, you'll be greatly missed. You, may you rest in peace. Here. The Honourable Member for Newmarket, Aurora. Mr. Speaker, in honour of Black History Month, I'm proud to rise today to speak on two principled and influential groups in my community of Newmarket, Aurora. Throughout the last two years, we have seen how COVID-19 has exposed systemic barriers for our Black and racialized community, across Newmarket Aurora and indeed throughout Canada. Both the Aurora Black Community or ABC and the Newmarket African Caribbean Canadian Association or NACA are leaders for both educating and sharing while creating an inclusive and connected community. Mr. Speaker, this month, as we rejoice in the virtues of ally and leadership, I wanna thank ABC and NACA for their continued and ongoing contributions to our community of Newmarket Aurora. From each corner of our community, ABC and NACA have been trailblazers for enacting real and permanent change in Newmarket and Aurora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Abitibi Bay James Nunavuk EU. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. La Resource, a local organization, does remarkable work to ensure that the gains made in helping people with disabilities are maintained. This organization allows them to benefit from financial resources that are available to them. To ensure the contu continuity of its services, La Resource needs money and relies, amongst other things, on donations. Throughout the year, it organizes fundraisers, and fortunately it can rely on people such as Mr. Tremblay to help them reach their goal. A few weeks ago, Mr. Pierre Tremblay initiated an event with Domaine du Lac Parent, a virtual fishing tournament, f and people from all over Abitibi, Bee to Mr. Mang, and outside the region were invited to send a picture of their catch of the day and participate in a draw. In closing, I would like to appeal to the generosity of the people in my region. Please make a donation for their 25th anniversary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dorval Lachine Lasalle. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On uh, February 11, 1990, Ni Nelson Mandela was freed after 27 years in prison. We all know why he was robbed of so much of his life 
And we all know the sacrifices he made so that millions of people oppressed by a deeply racist and inhumane system could have the same rights as the minority that crushed them. What Nelson Mandela accomplished for his country on the international level as well was monumental. However, his work is not finished. Now more than ever, when misinformed explanations try to muffle reality, and when some look away from the truth because it makes them uncomfortable, we should actively continue our work to combat racism and discrimination in its various forms. Precious moments of our lives pass us by. The hours turn into days, weeks, and months, and opportunities to t seek out one another pass us by as well. We lose that possibility to love one another, to get to know each other, and maybe create a lifetime of beautiful memories. In the end, when we have lived our lives, these are the only things that will matter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Prince George Peace River, Northern Rockies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I congratulate a very dedicated member of Northern BC, Judy Dejerle. Last month, Judy was elected Chief of the Blueberry River First Nations and just yesterday served her very first day as Chief. Judy said she is dedicated to bring unity back and building a prosperous future for her nation. For almost two decades, Judy and her husband, Boomer, have owned top-notch oil field contracting, providing good jobs and opportunity throughout our area. Judy has been a very vocal advocate for her community and for developing our abundant natural resources in Northern BC. Judy is a busy mom to Trinity Angel Dawson and deeply loves and respects her 81-year-old granny, Elder May Dominic. We all congratulate Judy on her election, and I look forward to working with her. Judy, may God continue to bless you and guide you as the mantle of leadership at the Blueberry is placed on your very capable shoulders. Lead on, Judy. Lead on. The Honourable Member for London North Centre. Mr. Speaker, the past few weeks have made clear that our democracy can and is being threatened. Constituents are rightly asking what the federal government is doing on their behalf. The invocation of the Emergencies Act is an extraordinary measure, but one that's justified by the current circumstances. Certain extra powers will be given to the federal government so that it can help bring the crisis to an end. These will be time-limited and subject to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Crucially, the military will not play an enforcement role. I also know that constituents want to help counter extremism because the government cannot solve this on its own. To them I say, do not despair. Volunteer for a local nonprofit focused on a cause that you care about. Condemn hate and the mistreatment of journalists. Speak up against misin misinformation. Join a political party that best reflects your values. Volunteer for political candidates you believe in. Most of all, show kindness. Kindness, kindness builds trust, and trust between citizens is what ultimately holds democracy together. Thank you very okay. much. The Honourable Member for Kitchener South Hespler. The Honourable Member for Kitchener South Hespler. Mr. Speaker, I rise in this House today to address something that is affecting all Canadians. My riding of Kitchener South Hespler is home to two Toyota plants, which directly employ over 5,000 employees. The situation at the Ambassador Bridge had a direct impact on the many constituents in my riding who work in the auto sector when the plants were fo forced to close for several days. Using blockades in cities and at border crossings has disrupted the lives of families across this country. I've heard from constituents in my riding of Kitchener South Hespler, thousands of whom were sent home from work as a direct result of the blockades. This is hurting our neighbours, crippling the manufacturing industry, disrupting the supply chain and making life even harder for all Canadians that have already gone through so much. I encourage and ask that all levels of government continue to work together on the current situation at our border crossings and allow Canadians to return to work. The Honourable Member for Mission Matsky Fraser Canyon. Mr. Speaker, almost eight months ago, Canadians watched in horror as a, as a devastating wildfire destroyed Lytton. Sadly, there are still no permits issued to rebuild homes or businesses. We are still waiting on debris removal. Residents are still waiting to hear if the land they once called home is ready to rebuild on. 
Many are worried the living expenses covered by their insurance companies and the Red Cross will run out before construction begins. The municipality itself faces the onerous task of replacing its records lost in the fire. It is still lacking today electricity, water, wastewater, telecommunications, and even a reliable post office. I'd like to recognize the BC government's $8.3 million in funding, but more needs to be done. Lytton needs help. The village cannot wait any longer. My constituents cannot wait any longer. We need to return the community to the people who made Lytton what it was. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Laval Les Îles. Mr. Speaker. Today, to recognize the 34th anniversary of the Sumget Pogrom, which took place in February 1988, when a large number of Armenians were subjected to mass killing and persecution by Azerbaijani forces as a result of their aspiration to live freely and with dignity. Many residents of Laval Les Îles remember these horrific acts and are disheartened that the same policy of hatred and persecution continues to haunt the Armenian people to this day, while Armenia and Arsak continue to face endless aggression from Azerbaijan, and many of their military personnel continue to be illegally held as prisoners of war. Through multilateralism, Canada will continue to bring its constructive input in the peaceful and fair resolution of this conflict while ensuring that Armenians and other minorities live peacefully, free of hate and discrimination. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary Confederation. Mr. Speaker, hardworking Canadians are frustrated with this Liberal government, and rightfully so. We see oil tankers full coming in on the East Coast from dictatorships, from human rights abusers, and those who have no respect for the environment. Yet, our ethically produced, environmentally responsible, job-creating Alberta oil is blocked from getting to the market. Canada is blessed with the third largest proven oil reserves on the planet. We have among the toughest environmental standards and employment standards. We have the foundation to be an energy independent country with enough left over to export. That is why it is so unacceptable that Canada imports energy from 114 other countries. It's time for this Liberal government to end energy imports. It's time for this Liberal government to support Canada's energy independence. It's time for this Liberal government to support Canadians. Uh, Annabelle, loud and proud. The Honourable Member for Regina Louvan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, my Conservative caucus colleagues and I had the distinct privilege of carrying through our motion to review and amend our Canadian Constitution. By unanimously removing a long-standing tax provision that granted special treatment to a large corporation, all members of this House played a critical role in opening up and fixing an error in our Constitution. Although not necessarily a headline-grabbing initiative, removing red tape and unfair provisions of our Constitution is an important task and a part of our responsibility to our constituents that have entrusted us and sent us all here. Tensions have been running high in this House for weeks as we debate issues that are important and have direct impact on the future of all Canadians. Given the fraught environment we currently find ourselves in, it is not lost on me the rarity of finding unanimous consent on any issue. So I thank members of this House, especially my 13 Saskatchewan Conservative colleagues, for the show of unity and getting this important work done. Thank you, and we will always be on Saskatchewan's side. After all, if we don't respect the Constitution, do we have respect for anything? <laughs> the Honourable Member for Halifax West. Mr. Speaker, today I proudly salute the national flag of Canada. It was 57 years ago that our beloved flag was raised on Parliament Hill for the first time. This enduring symbol represents our core national values of democracy and justice. In my life and in my time in public service, I've seen the high regard Canadians and people around the globe have for our flag. I've had the honor of joining countless citizenship ceremonies over the years where new and born Canadians took immense pride both in our flag and in being part of our broader Canadian family. Today, I encourage all Canadians to proudly display the flag, that iconic and internationally recognizable maple leaf, which symbolizes Canada, the land, and its people. Le drapeau. The national flag of Canada 
symbolizes hope and prosperity, as well as peace, tranquility, and neutrality. To all Canadians, happy Flag Day. The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, the Nuchaloth people lost a hero last fall. Willard Gallick Sr. was a respected elder of the Sashat First Nation. He passed at the age of 81 following a life of joy and accomplishment. He dedicated his life to standing up for Nuchaloth rights, treaty negotiations and language and culture. He worked on the docks and was an active member of Local 503 of the International Longshoremen's Union, becoming the first Indigenous person to be elected of their uh, president of their local and eventually international vice president. I met Willard when he invited me to a Reclaiming Lost Souls for Residential School Survivor Ceremony in 2019. On that day, he told us the residential school was put on Sashat land without permission of his people, but he called for a new beginning. We want to set souls free. We want to send them home, he said. The Indian agent had come for a six-year-old Willard in 1946, but his dad stood firm and Willard wasn't taken. You're not taking him, Willard told the story of his dad confronting the agent and my mom backed him up he said it was an act of courage that shaped the life of Kiki Kea a hero to his people may he rest in peace okay. the honorable member for Terrebonne thank you mr. speaker today we underscore a sad anniversary on February 15th 1939 was a sad day. There was a national liberation. So, in the f for democracy and the equality of peoples, we think it is our heritage to defend the rights of patriots. It is my duty as a politician and the duty of all Quebecers to remember the history of Terrebonne. It is where the first protest took place between loyalists and others. They were treated as traitors by the British. The Patriot flag is not just a symbol of rebel rebellion. It is the choice of a people to choose its destiny. Being a patriot is not just being a rebel. It's also believing in democracy. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Shukutimi Lafjord. Mr. Speaker, last night, an Olympic record was set in Beijing. Our speed skating team won a gold medal. We'd like to congratulate these Canadian women for their wonderful performance. I'd also like to particularly congratulate Valérie Maltin, our great pride. They won two medals in two different disciplines, and they have been, received medals in two different types of competitive skating, and this is the result of all the sacrifices you have made. Your perseverance and de determination have set you apart today. They're example for all Canadians. Canadians, congratulations once again, Valérie, and to your parents. And long live the Saguenay tradition in skating. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honour Wendell Waggle, who sadly passed in January. He proudly hailed from Windsor, graduated from Osgoode Hall in 1959, and began a career in law that he so dearly loved. I met him and had the honour of working with him at Hughes Amos, Mr. Speaker. The man, or W as he was known, was a giant, an icon, intimidating and inspirational at the same time, but most of all a true gentleman of the profession. He was a mentor to several generations of lawyers, myself included. A top litigation lawyer appointed Queen's Counsel in 1972, Wendell was respected by all. He generously shared his knowledge and wisdom both in teaching and serving as president of the Advocate Society and many other organizations. Wendell, Wendell was kind and giving, a loving husband, stepfather, grandpa and friend. Wendell will be deeply missed but not forgotten. Rest in peace, Mr. Wagle. Oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, yesterday, the Prime Minister invoked the Emergencies Act. 24 hours in, and there are more questions than answers. Questions about whether this is justified, 
questions around if the criteria is met, questions around what this means to Canadians' rights and freedoms. Parliamentary approval is required in order for the Prime Minister to use this unprecedented sledgehammer. So can the Prime Minister tell us when will Parliament de be debating this? Will it be coming to us on Friday? And does he expect that we will look at it Friday, but then rise, take a week off, and not actually deal with this until March? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, after discussions with Cabinet and Caucus, after consultations with the Premiers of all provinces and territories, after a conversation with the opposition leaders, we decided to invoke uh, the Emergencies Act to supplement provincial and territorial capacity to address the blockades and occupations. I want to be very clear, Mr. Speaker. The scope of these measures are time-limited and geographically targeted. They are reasonable and proportionate to the threats they are meant to address, and they are fully to be compliant with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms to uh, reassure all Canadians uh, that this is the right thing to move forward with. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. I, I had a very simple question to the Prime Minister he was not able to answer. It would appear this could be more political drama for the Prime Minister. He name calls people that he disagrees with. He wedges, he divides, he stigmatizes. Yet in spite of all of his failure, Coote's border has cleared. Windsor has opened up. Provinces and police are doing their jobs and blockades are starting to come down. But the Prime Minister thinks that now is the time to use this extreme measure and invoke the Emergencies Act. Isn't it true that the Prime Minister's actions could serve to actually make things worse and not make things better? Exactly. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, this is about keeping Canadians safe, protecting their communities and neighbourhoods, and ensuring the jobs and our economy. I'm afraid I'm going to have to interrupt the honourable, the right honourable prime minister. I'm trying to hear the answer, and I'm having a very difficult time. There's some shouting going on. I'm going to have to ask the honourable members maybe just keep it down. And if you've got something that you're not agreeing with, talk amongst yourself with someone next to you. You don't have to shout it out to the person across the floor. The right honourable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, you are absolutely right. This is a time for responsible leadership, not crass partisanship. The situation requires additional tools not held by other federal, provincial or territorial law. It's what responsible leadership requires. These measures must be and will be compliant with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We will always defend the rights of Canadians to peaceful assembly and to freedom of expression. But these blockades need to end, and unfortunately, Conservative politicians continue to encourage the leaders of these blockades. Right. Well, Leader of the Opposition. Well, let's get down to the basics of what this is really about. This is about the Prime Minister's ideological attachment to keeping COVID restrictions and mandates. 63% of Canadians want the restrictions and mandates to end. Conservatives presented a motion yesterday asking simply for a plan, but the Prime Minister is in denial and is ignoring the science. He might as well be back at the cottage because he's doing nothing productive or constructive to help this situation. Can the Prime Minister tell Canadians when he will end the divisive, outdated and unscientific mandate and restrictions. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, like I said, this is a time for responsible leadership to end these blockades. Unfortunately, the Conservatives continue to play partisan games. Uh, the Conservative member of Provence just yesterday... I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut off the uh, Prime Minister just for a second. And just... I mean, heckling is usually throwing one comment out. Clever, hopefully, although not always <laughs> necessary. But what I'm hearing is someone bullying and trying to drown someone out. That's not heckling. I just want everyone to take a deep breath. And I'll let the Prime Minister start from the top, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, we see that even in a moment of extremely challenging times when uh, people are moving forward with responsible leadership and responsible tools, the Conservatives can't help themselves but play class, crass political games and divide. The Conservative member for Provence just yesterday embraced the leaders of this blockade and amplified their cause. The Conservative member for Yorkton Melville said this weekend that blockaders who ripped down 
fencing around our national war memorial are patriots. The conservative leadership contender from Carleton continues to say he's proud. The honourable member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, for 17 days, the Prime Minister didn't lift a finger over what was happening in Ottawa. Instead, he insulted people who didn't share his opinion. As a result, yesterday, the Prime Minister pulled out an act that hasn't been used for half a century. He didn't consult the Premiers. He just informed them. But more than half of them are against this. And the Prime Minister is simply pouring oil on the fire. Why does the Prime Minister always try to cover up his inaction in this way? The Honourable Prime Minister, since the outset, Mr. Speaker, we've been working responsibly with local authorities, with various jurisdictions to combat this illegal blockade. And we will continue to ensure that local police have all the tools they need. And that's precisely what we did yesterday. We brought additional tools to the table that local p police, the police of jurisdiction, can use when dealing with blockades and roadblocks. I know the opposition tends to be support those who are blocking our economy, but we do not. The Honourable Member for Louis saint -Laurent. Mr. Speaker, Canadians have seen in recent days that things were improving without the Emergencies Act. That happened in Ontario, it happened in Alberta, and it could have happened here in Ottawa. But no, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister would prefer to invoke legislation that hasn't been used in 50 years to continue to divide and insult and provoke instead of looking for a compromise. Why does the Prime Minister not consult Canadians and premiers, including his own member from Louis Hébert. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are sick and tired of COVID and restrictions, but they're also tired of people blocking their streets and impeding their access to uh, goods and services. And that's why we've had to take responsible steps to allow the provinces and local jurisdictions to maintain supply chains and keep our streets clear of illegal demonstrations. We will always be there to support our police forces with the tools that are charter consistent and to protect our values and rights. Is that the Honourable Member for Chambly. Mr. Speaker, Ottawa has lost control over Ottawa. But the Ambassador Bridge situation was solved without the Emergencies Act. The situation in Quebec was managed very well without the Emergencies Act. The Prime Minister made a commitment to limit the geographic use of the Emergencies Act, but the actual order doesn't say that at all. Will the Prime Minister promise to explicitly exclude Quebec from the application of this emergency order. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Emergencies Act gives additional tools to police forces all across the country in an emergency situation, as we've seen all over the country, more or less, and in many places. They have managed to deal with these barricades, but we know that the risk remains a fact, and it's up to local police in Quebec or elsewhere. They will have the tools available to them if they need them, Mr. Speaker. Those measures are proportionate, they're responsible, and they will only be used if needed by local police. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Mr. Speaker, the parties at the National Assembly in Quebec aren't interested. The government of Quebec is not interested. The Bloc Québécois is not interested either. And I hear among our neighbours that Alberta is not interested, Saskatchewan is not interested, Manitoba is not interested. Is the Prime Minister shopping around 
uh, is he, does he really want, is he looking for support to impose legislation in Quebec against Quebec's will? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Emergencies Act applies against illegal barricades and blockades that may crop up here and there all around the country. This is a response that we have come up with. It's responsible, it's proportionate, and it's limited both in time and in its geographic application. And it still protects our rights and freedoms under the Charter. We are reacting responsibly, and we will continue to be there for Canadians who are suffering. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Sadly, we are in this crisis because we've seen a, a failure to take this crisis seriously at all levels of government. And now we're seeing Indigenous and racialized people look at the double standard that the convoy is being treated as compared to those protesters. And we also have deeply disturbing reports of military and police personnel who've expressed sympathy and support for the convoy. So will the Prime Minister provide assurances in this House that the police will use the powers given to protect people and not support the occupation? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the measured and responsible use of the Emergencies Act that we uh, announced yesterday gives specific time-limited proportional tools to police of local jurisdiction and their partners to be able to ensure that these illegal blockades end, to make sure that people who have now fully been heard by all Canadians choose to go home. These are the things uh, that Canadians expect uh, from their orders of government, and I can say that we have worked extremely closely across orders of government uh, with all different places of jurisdiction to ensure that Canadians get their streets and their lives back. Well, member for Burnaby South. When it dans une crise nationale, we're in a national crisis, and we aren't seeing the end of it yet. Weapons were found in Coots, and the situation is getting worse in Ottawa. So obviously, an end must be put to this occupation. But it's also clear that there's no occupation in Quebec. So is the Prime Minister willing to promise that these emergency measures will not be applied where they're not needed? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Emergencies Act makes extra tools available to local governments and local police forces supported by the RCMP if needed. We're not going to impose anything anywhere where it's not needed. These are simply tools that local police may or may not use. It's up to them. It's a matter of ensuring that we have all the tools we need to ensure that we put an end to these illegal blockades. Parkland. Mr. Speaker, the invocation of the Emergencies Act for the first time in Canadian history is a damning indictment on the failure of this Prime Minister here, to address here. the situation. The Prime Minister once said, I quote, when a government asks its citizens to give up even a small portion of their liberty, it is not simply enough to say, trust us. That trust must be earned, it must be checked, and it must be renewed. These are his words. Canadians do not trust this Prime Minister. When will he stop undermining Canadians' rights and start Start renewing Canadians' trust. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, um, Canadians can trust that this government will always follow the science and the best evidence to get us out of this pandemic, and that includes getting vaccinated, Mr. Speaker. And contrary to what my colleague says, this is an illegal blockade. This illegal blockade is not about the, the vaccines or the mandates. It's about a very small organized group who are trying to upend our way of life, Mr. Speaker. Now, we've made progress. We've seen the Ambassador Bridge reopen. We've seen Coots reopen. We've seen Surrey reopen. And, Mr. Speaker, yesterday, yes, we invoked the Emergencies Act so that we can secure that progress and give law enforcement all of the tools they need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Well, we'll see if the Prime Minister answers this one. Every opportunity... Oh. Yes, Escalate. His divisive conduct has been a lesson. 
person in abject failure. Blockades should come down. They are already coming down across this country. But now the Prime Minister has invoked the Emergencies Act to punish Canadians who, in his words, hold unacceptable views. Why is the Prime Minister punishing Canadians for their political views? The right, uh, the Honourable Government House Leader. That the former Conservative leader, uh, now the member for Regina Capel with the Conservative Party, said the following. These protesters, these activists, may have the luxury of spending days at a time at, the blockade, uh, at a blockade, but they need to check their privilege. They need to check their privilege and let the people whose jobs depend on the railway system and small business and farmers do their jobs. And what have they said now, in this context from the beginning, as swastikas flew, as Confederate flags flew? They have absolutely the opposite of responsible leadership. Instead of de-escalating, they escalated at every turn. Can we go on? L'honorable député, honorable member for Port Neuf Jacques Cartier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all want the blockade outside Parliament to end quickly and peacefully. The inaction of this government has forced them to play catch-up and to impose emergency legislation. They would do well to learn from the premiers who have managed to control the demonstrators without special legislation. Will the Prime Minister promise not to use his emergency powers in the many provinces opposed to them. Mr. Speaker, it was the former leader of the Conservative Party, the member for Regina Capel, who said that it was unacceptable to have demonstrations blocking critical infrastructure. And what is the Conservative Party doing today? Today, the Conservative Party is taking selfies and encouraging tweets. That's not responsible what they're doing. It's completely irresponsible. The Honourable Member for Paul Neuf Jacques Cartier. Mr. Speaker, it's the government. They're the ones who are irresponsible. I'll repeat my question and I would invite the leader to listen to the question. PEI, New Brunswick, Alberta, Quebec, they're not interested in public health measures. They're sick and tired of them. The government should not require the provinces to suffer under these public health measures, these restrictions. The Honourable Government House Leader, that's so irresponsible. We have a duty, all of us here have a duty to protect Canadians. It's not just on our duty on this side of the House of Commons. And I want to make it clear, it's time to stop the tweets and the encouragement of people demonstrating outside. It is time to take reasonable steps, reasonable action, and it's time for the Conservative Party to act responsibly. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Midnapur. Are you done now? For two years, the Prime Minister has insisted he is making decisions based. I, I just want to remind the Honourable Members to place their questions through the Speaker. A letter restart. A letter restart or question Sorry, Mr. Speaker, from the top. I'll say it again, my apologies. For two years, the Prime Minister has insisted he is making decisions based on science. Canadians sacrificed, they isolated, closed businesses, got vaccinated because experts advised it was the safest way forward. Now, those same experts say it is time to ease restrictions. Premiers are listening, but this Prime Minister believes he knows better and has invoked the Emergency Measures Act. Does the Prime Minister intend to force provinces to implement measures they, and science, disagree with? The Honourable Government House Leader. 
I'll tell you what I'm done with. I'm done with uh, seeing as this protest continues, as illegal actions continue that cost billions of dollars to businesses, that terrorize downtown residents. I am tired of seeing conservative tweets, such as the member from Bravanche who's saying that he supports it, the member for Yorkton Melville saying that this that ripping down barricades in front of a war memorial is a patriotic act, watching somebody who aspires to be leader of Conservative Party saying that what's happening outside is something he stands by. That is enough. Please, it's time to end this. Stop supporting what's going on outside. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Bindapur. Mr. Speaker, the rest of the world is opening up and returning to normal, where the science supports it. Provinces are providing Canadians with hope for the first time in two years, contrary to this Prime Minister, whose lack of leadership has brought him to invoke the Emergency Measures Act, traumatizing Canadians. He is well aware that many provinces are opposed to these measures. He is also well aware that the science says that they are not needed. Will this Prime Minister force provinces to implement measures that they had independently decided to remove? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, Canada has one of the lowest death rates in the world, one of the highest vaccination rates in the world. It has met the challenge of this pandemic. But what has not been met in this hour of history is that as the, the, the chaos descended outside, as protesters began to shut down critical infrastructure, we had lawmakers, people of this House, going out and encouraging their activity. And I have to ask, Mr. Speaker, if they didn't have lawmakers who were elected by constituents encouraging their legal actions, when would have this been over? I think it would have been over a lot sooner. The Honourable Member for Avignon, La Métis, Matan, Matapédia. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister said yesterday that the Emergencies Act wasn't something to be taken lightly. Indeed, it hasn't even been used since it was passed in 1988, before I was even born. It's really supposed to be the very last resort. The Prime Minister himself said it's not the first tool we've used, not even the second or third. Well, he didn't use a first tool, a second tool, or a third tool. He used zero tools before he came up with the most extreme option. Is that really reasonable? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for her question. It's true that a lot of progress has been made at the borders in Surrey and Coots and Windsor, where the Ambassador Bridge is now reopened. That's good for trade. But yesterday, we invoked the Emergencies Act in order to provide new tools, innovative tools, to help police forces put an end to this illegal blockade. That is what a responsible government does. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister did not get in touch with the people who have besieged Parliament for 19 days now. He didn't send his share of the 1,800 law enforcement officers requested by the City of Ottawa. He didn't create a crisis unit, including all governments and police forces. He didn't consult his partners in Quebec and the provinces before informing them of his decision to invoke the Emergencies Act. Does the Prime Minister believe that this legislation should really be the first step the government has taken in response? The Honourable Member, Minister, uh, with all due respect, perhaps my colleague hasn't been aware of the news. There have been three installments of RCMP uh, being loaned to local police enforcement in Ottawa and in Windsor, and now the Ambassador Bridge is open again. That's good for the economy. That's good for everyone. So we've done a lot, but we have to also consider further tools, new tools, to help the police finally put an end to this illegal blockade. Thank you. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, the Premier of Quebec was clear. Quebec doesn't need the Emergencies Act. The Government of Quebec doesn't want it. The National Assembly is unanimously opposed to this being used in Quebec. But yesterday, the Prime Minister said it would be geographically limited. But the Order and Council applies all across Canada, including Quebec. 
Why is the prime minister who claims to be consulting, why has he decided to run roughshod over Quebec's request once again? Why should this law apply in Quebec? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to reassure my colleague that we are going to continue to offer resources uh, under this act. Yesterday, we invoked the Emergencies Act. It's temporary. It's limited in scope, and the measures are targeted. This tool will be implemented together with the provinces and territories, even Quebec. Thank you. Peterborough, Kawartha. Mr. Speaker, yesterday during a press conference, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, some people will say we moved too quickly. Other people will say, no, we should have acted weeks ago. The reality is this. The Emergencies Act is not something to take lightly. It is not the first thing you turn to, nor the second, nor the third. So my question is, Mr. Speaker, can the Prime Minister please tell Canadians what first, second, and third actions he took before invoking the Emergencies Act? The Honourable Minister for Emergency Preparedness. You know, right from the outset of the blockades and the disruptions that were taking place in Ottawa and then the blockades at our critical infrastructure at our ports of entry, our government has worked with municipal and provincial partners right across the country in order to ensure that they had the resources and the support they needed to keep Canadians safe. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask the minister to repeat. I'm right next to you, or to the honourable member, and I can't hear it because of the shouting. If I can ask the member, the, the honourable minister to start from the top so that at least I can hear it and hopefully uh, the honourable member for Peterborough McQuartha can hear the answer. Uh, first, Mr. Speaker, I'm actually very glad to see that the, the Conservatives have once again changed their position on something important, whereas first they supported these, 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 these blockades, and now they, that there's, they recognize that this is a largely foreign-funded, targeted and coordinating attack on Canadian critical infrastructure, they flip-flopped. Good for them. We're all getting used to it. Well, member for Peterborough, Kawartha. Mr. Speaker, I think the person or the... The party that has flip-flopped is the Liberals. Last week, you said you had all the tools you needed, they needed, to do this. And now we have an Emergency Measures Act. Yeah. We were told we would never need federal vaccine mandates. That changed. Now you're saying it's just jurisdiction. How can we trust this government? How, how much authority does the Prime Minister need for to set an unprecedented Emergency Measures Act? How much authority? Does he need? Oh. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the evidence, the evidence is clear. The, the, a largely foreign-funded, targeted and coordinating attack on, on critical Canadian infrastructure at our borders is hurting Canada and harming Canadians. And Mr. Speaker, it was equally clear that we needed to do more and we would have to do what was required. Mr. Speaker, we've introduced measures that will create greater financial scrutiny and financial consequences for the people who are engaged in this criminal behaviour. The evidence of firearms at Coots elevates the risk to Canadian security and safety, and we will do what is required to keep Canadians safe. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon West. Mr. Speaker, last Friday, the Prime Minister said that the Ottawa police had enough resources to deal with the protesters. That's right. And on Monday, he calls for emergency measures. Boy, that escalated quickly. <laughs> he had 17 days to act, and after hiding at his cottage on his MacBook for the first week, he did nothing but divide and stigmatize. Mr. Speaker, the constituents in Saskatoon West want to know, what changed in the Prime Minister's mind over the weekend to justify such drastic measures? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure my colleague that the RCMP has been supporting and aiding the Ottawa Police Service to enforce uh, public safety, not only here in Ottawa, but in Windsor, where we've reopened the Ambassador Bridge, in Coots, where the borders reopened, in Surrey, where the borders reopened, and that's good. It's good for the economy, it's good for Canadians who can get back to work, Mr. Speaker. And yesterday's invocation of the Emergencies Act is meant to secure those gains so that we give the police all of the tools that they, that they need, whether it's declaring certain zones which are adjacent to our borders to our national symbols, Mr. Speaker. It's important for the Conservatives to ask those participating in the illegal blockades to now go home. 
The Honourable Member for Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, for too long, Conservatives have been calling on this government to remove the mandatory PCR test requirements for those entering Canada. In my riding of Niagara Falls, this policy has had a devastating impact on our economy. Visits from the U.S. are nowhere near the record levels reached in 2019, and these expensive costs put on our visitors and Canadians traveling prevent them from visiting uh, their families and loved ones. My residents want to know this. When will all federal travel mandates be ended? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my honourable colleague for giving me the opportunity to share with him and all members of this House and all Canadians the great announcement that myself and our colleagues made today. Today, based on the science and the public health advice we received, we eased our travel measure, including, Mr. Speaker, allowing incoming travellers to use an antigen test instead of the PCR test, pre-departure test. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Windsor West. Unlawful blockades at the borders across the country, including Windsor and Coots, have been shown that the Liberals have not done the proper serious work necessary to ensure that our borders are protected and the citizens that live nearby are safe. These illegal blockades have hurt every Canadian by hurting thousands of people from getting to work and supporting their families. We have long been calling for a safe border task force, reinstate cuts from the CBSA intelligence, and also to make sure that municipalities are reinstated for their costs. To the Prime Minister, will he finally listen to our calls to ensure that safe borders are going to happen or he's going to continue to listen to extremists. The, the bridge might be open now, but the threat hasn't stopped. Will he act? The Honourable Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I share my Honourable colleague's concern, and I can inform the House that I've been in routine contact with him, as well as the municipal leaders uh, in Windsor, including the Mayor of Windsor. And I've assured him, and the government will continue to provide all of the resources that the community of Windsor needs to keep that bridge open. That means, yes, making sure that police have the assets that they need, be it tow trucks, be it barriers, be it whatever resources, so that we can keep the right. economy rolling, the bridge open, and get Canadians back to work. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. And what about Alberta? You know, Mr. Speaker, yesterday the RCMP arrested 13 extremists blockading the border at Coots. They seized guns, ammunition, and body armor, including assault weapons with thousands of rounds. This comes after convoy leaders raised millions from foreign donors with a stated goal to overthrow the government. And while I'm happy to see that the blockade appears to be ending in Alberta, the fact remains that we had an armed militia active in Alberta. This is unthinkable. Why did it take 18 days and proof of an armed threat to make the government act and protect Albertans and Canadians? Minister for Emergency Preparedness. Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the member for that very important question, and, and I think it does reveal, and we agree, that what we have seen in, 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 in Coots, Alberta, and in a number of these blockades, illegal blockades across the country, is that the threat is not yet gone. And that's precisely why, Mr. Speaker, we've introduced through these measures of the Emergency, measures, the emergency Act that we introduced yesterday that will increase, for example, the financial scrutiny and consequences of these illegal acts that will also make available equipment and authorities that our law enforcement officials need to maintain and restore public safety and to protect Canada's interests. Well, member for Davenport. Mr. Speaker, since the Government of Canada announced its ambitious plan for a $10 a day early learning and childcare system across the country, we have signed agreements with nine provinces and three territories. Already in some provinces, families are seeing a reduction in their childcare fees, making life more affordable. But those in my riding of Davenport in downtown West Toronto are wondering, when is Ontario going to sign on? And when will they too be able to benefit from our national childcare program? Can the Minister any updates on the federal government's efforts to reach a childcare agreement with Ontario? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my honourable colleague from Davenport for that important question. We have now signed agreements with 12 provinces and territories across the country. That means that families from
from coast to coast to coast, except for in Ontario at this point in time, will have access to 50% reduction in fees by the end of this calendar year. Good Mr. Year. Speaker, I remain very optimistic that we will sign an agreement with Ontario. There is a fair deal on the table, $10.2 billion this that will go to helping families line. decrease the costs of childcare and make life more affordable. Full member for Abbotsford. Our Canadians are stressed. Paychecks don't buy what they used to. In fact, the cost of everything, gasoline, groceries, housing, is at all-time highs. Families are getting left behind. So last April, I wrote to the minister to warn her of exactly that. I highlighted the dangers of uncontrolled borrowing and how excessive stimulus spending would stoke inflationary pressures. She either doesn't care or didn't read my letter. So to the minister, what specifically is she doing to get inflation under control? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives continue, actually in all aspects of Canadian life, to put forward a false narrative. And the latest false narrative we've just been hearing today is about the economy. The reality is that the Canadian economy is recovering strongly from the COVID recession. In the third quarter, our GDP grew by 5.4%. That is higher than the US, Japan, the UK, and Australia. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? When it comes to our debt-to-GDP ratio, our AAA credit rating was reaffirmed in the fall by S&P and Moody's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Well, we will never get inflation under control as long as that minister keeps borrowing and spending like there's no tomorrow. Not only did the minister ignore our concerns, she also ignored the warnings of the parliamentary budget officer who questioned the wisdom of her stimulus spending, pumping more money into the economy when the cost of living is skyrocketing. This minister is making this crisis worse. This problem is not transitory. Month by month, the inflation numbers are going up. When will the minister finally do something to protect Canadians against the skyrocketing cost of living? Yeah, yeah. Right to the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, the real question is when will the Conservatives stick with a policy or stick with a leader? Because I was on the campaign trail in the summer and so were the members opposite. And they actually campaigned on proposed government spending higher than our own proposal. We proposed a deficit for 21-22 of $156.9 billion. They campaigned on a proposed deficit of $168 billion. So I wonder if the party of flip-flops can tell Canadians where they stand today. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The excise escalator tax increase will crush wineries, breweries, cideries and distilleries' bottom line. The excise escalator tax is automatic. And here's the kicker. It's based on the CPI index, meaning because inflation is so high, the tax will be even higher than ever before starting April 1st. This tax is based on inflation. It's taxing inflation, which will make inflation go up even more on these important value-added agricultural products. Products. So will the Liberals commit to cancel this inflationary excise tax increase? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, it is a bit rich of the Conservatives to be talking about supporting small businesses of any kind in this country. After all, Mr. Speaker, this is the party which, when we, before Christmas, proposed absolutely essential support for small business to help them get through Omicron. What did the Conservatives do at that crucial moment? They voted against our measures. So really, Mr. Speaker, we will take no lessons about supporting business from them. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. That wasn't an answer to my question at all. Uh, when Canadian winery, brewery, cidery and distillery workers wake up and owners on April 1st, they'll be hit with this automatic tax increase on excise thanks to the Liberals. 
95 percent of these producers are small businesses who have already been hit with payroll tax increases, labour shortages, increases in debt and slower sales due to perpetual lockdowns. Mm -hmm. Now is not the time to be increasing any taxes on small businesses. So will the Liberals cancel this bad April Fool's Day tax increase? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me tell you what hurts Canadian small businesses. What hurts Canadian small businesses is when, for solely for the sake of partisan posturing, people who were elected to this House to support the small businesses in their communities oppose the small business support that small businesses themselves are calling for. And you know what else has hurt Canadian businesses, small ones and big ones too? The blockade of the Ambassador Bridge. And members on that side of the House were giving succour and encouragement to those blockades. That is unacceptable. The Honourable Member for Montarville. Mr. Speaker, today, February 15th, is Flag Day. Canada is celebrating the maple leaf flag. And indeed, it's being celebrated. We are seeing more Canadian flags than ever in the streets of downtown Ottawa. In fact, it's even being flown in demonstrations in the States, France and New Zealand. The Canadian flag has literally become the international symbol of movements that in some cases have gone so far as to aim to overturn democratically elected governments. Does the Prime Minister of Canada realize, the Honourable Minister, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for underscoring that today is Flag Day, a flag that brings us all together, Mr. Speaker especially proud government members from Quebec who are proud Canadians, and there are also proud Quebec Canadians on the other side. In any case, I'd like to thank our colleague for having raised this so that we can all together celebrate Flag Day. The Honourable Member from Montarville, Mr. Speaker, this government's milquetoast reaction thus far means that not only are we an international laughing stock, but also a global incitement to disorder. Yesterday, the Prime Minister was asked about the effect of this crisis on Canada's international reputation. And he replied that the turning point was the blockade of the Ambassador Bridge. But the real turning point was when occupiers besieged his country's capital without his doing the slightest thing about it. For 19 days, he's been letting the occupiers run rampant around Ottawa, and now he's announced that he's taking the nuclear option, the Emergencies Act. How is it even possible to be all out of ideas when you haven't tried a thing? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, since we're still talking about our flag, I think it's very important to say what it ultimately symbolizes around the globe. Pride not only for us as Canadians, but the role our country has played throughout history in conflict resolution, international aid development. All Canadians, including Quebecers, are very proud of our flag. And once again, I'd like to thank our colleague for having reminded us that it's very important to celebrate our flag. Number four, Bay of Quinty. Mr. Speaker, for weeks, Canadians looking for hope have been looking for a Prime Minister to listen to their concerns and listen to their needs as the rest of the world opened up. Instead, they heard from a Prime Minister with an escalating tone that left them feeling traumatized, stigmatized and divided. Even today, he's calling out and blaming other parties who have been listening instead of pitting Canadian versus Canadian and showing real leadership. Yep. Why do Canadians have to pay with their freedoms to cover up for this government's failed leadership? Hey. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker. I think we have different uh, definitions of division. To me, when critical infrastructure is being blocked, when illegal protesters are outside, when we see swastikas and Confederate flags going out and taking photographs and giving coffee, I don't think that's healthy for the country, Mr. Speaker. Instead, what I think would be healthy to, is to say to those that would seek to divide us, those that would seek to exploit our differences, to say those kinds of radical views do not have a place 
place in this country. It's time to go home. It's time to end this illegal activity. And it's time to come together as a country. The Honorable Member for Dauphin, Swan River, Minipua. Mr. Speaker, I sat on a survey last month asking my constituents what was their biggest concerns. The cost of living was the number one issue. One of my constituents named Rick wrote to me and stated, the food prices are out of my pay range. Mr. Speaker, inflation is record at record highs due to this Liberal government's spending. So what does the Prime Minister have to say to Rick, who can't afford to put food on his table? Yeah, yeah. Good question. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government absolutely understands that affordability matters for Canadian families. And that's why we are there for them. We lower taxes for the middle class and raise them on the wealthiest 1%. We created the Canada Child Benefit, which is indexed to inflation, and now a single mother with two children can receive up to $13,600 from the CCB. The Climate Action Incentive gives the average family in Alberta $981, in Saskatchewan $961, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, at the beginning of COVID, all the parties came together to support relief programs for Canadians and businesses. Now the economy is opening up, but the government's money printing press is still humming. Experts are now warning this government, what members of this side of the House have been warning for some time, that this government's future spending plan will lead to more inflation. Mr. Speaker, let's give the minister one last chance. When will this government rein in its out-of-control spending? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Speaker, as I pointed out a moment ago, it is actually the members opposite, the members of the party of flip-flops, who campaigned on a platform which proposed higher spending in this fiscal year than we proposed. So let's remind Canadians of that. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to supporting small business, it was this party, contrary to what the member just asserted, that opposed the essential support small businesses needed that we proposed before Christmas. The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Grenville. Monsieur le Président, les parents de ma circonscription. Mr. Speaker, parents in my riding understand that putting their kids in French immersion programs enriches them culturally and gives them an advantage later in life. However, due to a shortage of teachers and long wait lists, it can often be difficult to register for French immersion. Can the Minister of Official Languages tell the House how our government will give more children the chance to learn French? The Honourable Minister of Official Languages. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my, my colleague and friend for Vancouver, for Vancouver Granville for this excellent question. Our government understands that offering children more French language learning opportunities today means more bilingual Canadians in future. In Budget 2021, we invested in eliminating wait lists. And we will work with our partners to keep improving access to French immersion and French as a second language program throughout the country. We will always be there to help communities, Mr. Speaker. Prefer South Shore St. Margaret's. Today, more fishermen have been lost at sea and our hearts go out to them. Captains know the risk of sinking while fishing. Mm -hmm. What Adam Newell wasn't counting on was losing his vessel while tied up at a DFO wharf. Adam saw his vessel smash into the rocks tied to that wharf. DFO wharfs are falling into the ocean. Adam would not have lost his vessel if the government had not ignored four fishery committee reports of this house. Sure. When will the government act so more vessels are not lost tied up at the wharf? Without wharfs, we can't fish. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Fisheries. Speaker. Ninety percent of Canadian seafood goes through small craft harbours and Canada's fish har har harvesters depend on these facilities to support their livelihoods. And so that's why in Budget 2021, we allocated $300 million wow. to repair and re replace yeah, yeah. these wharves over the next two yeah, years. Yeah. We're working to make sure that communities have the harbors that they need and that they're in good repair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
The Honorable Member for Montmagny, Lisley, Kamouraska Rivière du Loup. Mr. Speaker, the Furbaco family, made up of three future citizens from my riding, has been waiting for their permanent residency cards for months. Other applicants' files are being moved ahead of them in the line, and they've had to endure n never ending delays of over 180 days. This means that they can't renew their Quebec health insurance cards, even though they work and pay taxes there. Does the government find this acceptable, first of all? And secondly, what will it do to fix this situation? The Honourable Minister. I'd like to thank my colleague, Mr. Speaker, for that question. Well, I'd like to mention some of the progress already made. We have gone back to a period of 12 months for spousal sponsoring applications. We have also processed 500,000 new requests, which is a great increase. It's quite clear that COVID-related uh, COVID related co closures around the world have had an impact, but we are continuing to modernize the system to make it more resilient and in order to be able to support our objective of welcoming more residents. Kent Leamington. Hey. Mr. Speaker, on Friday I asked this government if it was their intent to place public health policy in direct conflict with immigration legislation. Once their working permits expire after February 28th, some guest workers are trapped in Canada without status, separated from their family, separated from work. The Minister of Immigration's response made it clear that this government had no apparent idea of this policy conflict. When will this Liberal government treat innocent people fairly, humanely, and respect them and fix this Liberal fiasco? That's right. Yeah. The Honourable Minister. I thank the member for his question, and as always, our commitment in uh, modernizing our immigration system is relevant. I was very happy to see that our government invested $85 million in improving our immigration system. And Mr. Speaker, we are more than happy that to say to you, um, as we talk about some of the success of 2021, that we welcome more than 405,000 new permanent residents last year. We are welcoming more skilled workers and international students you know, Mr. Speaker, we need to do better, and we're continuing to do better for Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, the Gladio Principles and Park recognize that there's overrepresentation of Indigenous people in the criminal justice system, and that there are complex issues based on systemic discrimination, which should be considered in sentencing. They now have been used in the courts and sentencing for quite some time. However, in the final report of the National Inquiry on Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls, point of order, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we have a point of order. The Honourable Member for Manicouaga. Thank you very much. The interpreter is just raising that the sound is of poor quality and does not permit interpretation. This is something that comes up often, and I understand there has been some accommodation made. I'm going to have to talk with our technical folks so that we can make it so that uh, the honorable member. Uh, I'm going to ask the honorable. Excuse me, excuse me. You can interrupt each other, but when you interrupt the speaker, you don't want to get him upset. The Honourable Member for Northwest Territories, does he have a headset there that he can use? I'll come back to him for a question. Just for the microphone, I understand there's some problems with the hearing, but with the microphone, that would be the only way to get the interpretation. Otherwise, we're going to miss half the question, and that's not really uh, good for anyone, not for the member, nor for those here. I'm sorry, but uh, we're not getting interpretation on that microphone. It's a technical issue. We'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll go to the next question and maybe we'll see if we can get that resolved for the next one. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. 
Major General Fraser said Canada pulled out of Afghanistan way too early and 10,000 Afghan interpreters and their families have been left behind. He also said the Liberals failed to provide a whole of government plan to help resettle them. While our allies are on the ground helping Afghans get to safety, this government is sending emails telling Afghans to somehow get to a third country on their own. As the situation gets worse, this government still hasn't provided exemptions so NGOs can get aid to starving children. When will the Liberals act with the urgency that the situation demands to help bring Afghans to safety? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada remains firm in its commitment to welcome 40,000 Afghan refugees in Canada. We are sparing no efforts to resettle Afghan refugees as quickly as we can. And I am happy to report that more than 7,500 Afghan refugees have begun their new lives here in Canada, over welcome, over overcoming extreme challenges. And we are welcoming new arrival every week. We will continue to do everything we can to to show leadership in the face of the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. Well, member for Timmins, Timmins James Bay. Well, when it comes to assessing the Prime Minister's credibility on the climate crisis, the truth is found in the lobbying registry. Because over the last two years, his government ruled out the red carpet for big oil with over 370 meetings. No wonder big oil isn't sweating his promise of a tough emissions cap. In fact, they told our committee they plan to vastly increase production, and that position is backed by the energy regulator. So, to the environment minister, what kind of credible cap is there that includes Includes massive increases in oil exports. The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank my honourable colleague for his question, and I've I've asked him that before, and he still hasn't answered. But I would like him to show me a country in the world that has done more in the last four or five years than we have to fight climate change. More than a hundred measures, hundred billion dollars of investment, re regulations on methane, clean fuel standards. Electricity. These are all things we're doing, and we have so much more to do, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. L'honorable député de Longueuil, Charles Moine. Mr. Speaker, the Gladue principles in part recognize that there is an overrepresentation of Indigenous people in the criminal justice system, and that here are complex issues based on systemic discrimination, which should be considered in sentencing. They now have to be used in courts and sentencing for quite some time. However, in the final report of the National Inquiry of Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls, many participants expressed concerns about over lenient sentences in cases of violence against Indigenous women and girls. Does the Minister of Justice have an answer to those worried about the Gladue principles negatively impacting the safety and justice for Indigenous women and girls? Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank the honourable member for asking that question in the stead of the honourable member from the Northwest Territories, and I thank him for his leadership and his wisdom, Mr. Speaker. The Gladue principles, just like the revitalization of Indigenous justice systems, calls to action from the TRC, the implementation plan for the MMIWG, are concrete steps towards making our justice system fairer. But we understand, Mr. Speaker, there are still systemic issues in our criminal justice system that we need to address. It's impossible to undo centuries of colonialism in only a few short years. Mr. Speaker, far too many women and girls endure serious injustice, including discrimination and disproportionately high rates of violence. We're going to work on this with Indigenous leadership, Mr. Speaker, to get... I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. C'est tout le temps que nous avons aujourd'hui. Rising on a point of order, I believe the Honourable Member for South Shore, St. Margaret's. Has point a... of order, Mr. Speaker. Uh, arising out of question period, I'd like to seek unanimous consent to table the four.